Like I said, the, shows are, the show and the game are going to evolve together. That means the universe is going to evolve together. So something that happens on the show will um, appear in the game. This is Rob Hill, senior producer at Tryon Worlds. It's 2011 and he's just wrapped up an E3 presentation on an exciting new IP he and his team have been working on, Defiance. Tryon have partnered with Sci-Fi to develop a video game and a TV show which tell one big simultaneous story. It promises to be a thrilling science fiction adventure which bridges the gap between TV and gaming, creating an entertainment experience which will give them storytelling opportunities outside of the limits of video games and... If that just sounds like buzzwords to you, it's because it is. Its phraseology will hear parroted by Rob, the development team, and particularly Tryon's executives over the game's development. Defiance is going to redefine storytelling. It's a third-person shooter MMO where events which happen in the game influence the TV show that airs alongside it. The player will be both participant and director of the episodes. But as the release date of Defiance draws near, there's suddenly a shift in how the creators talk about the melding of the game and the TV show. So you're gonna have a show and um, uh, the okay. game, obviously, running at the same time. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, let me tell you first about the game. Let me tell you first about the game. The sentence which starts to trump curious questions from interviewers about how exactly Defiance's TV connections will work. Suddenly, the development team don't want to talk about the show anymore. They just want to talk about the game world, about the guilds, the factions, the gunplay. The more involved sci-fi become in the architecture of Defiance's story, the more Tryon tried to shift the conversation away from the small screen. Either because they're losing faith in the show, or because they're being kept out of the loop, something has has happened to change their messaging. And then, in April 2013, the game releases. Dull quest design, swarms of festering bugs, a complete lack of agency over a game world players were promised they could shape, plummet review scores. Whatever turbulence took place behind the scenes, it suddenly becomes clear that the show and the game aren't as interconnected as they first appeared, relegating TV connections to imaginatively dubbed short episode missions. The game gets panned. The TV show chugs along but ultimately gets cancelled. Sci-Fi collect their losses and a few years later Tryon tries his whole sorry mess again with Defines 2050, a soft reboot without a TV show which dropped to less than a thousand players just a month after its release and shut down its servers in 2021. A small hardcore fan base still occasionally rally for a Defines comeback but Tryon and Sci-Fi's experiment becomes background noise. A weird little story for freaks like me to bring up whenever a friend muses, you know, video games might replace movies one day. But let's go back to 2013 for a second. It's May, one month after Defiance has released. I am holed up in my bedroom, bashing my head against my keyboard because the game servers have kicked me out for the third time in one play session. I take a break, jump onto YouTube, and see that the Xbox showcase has started streaming. Watch TV. It's TV. TV and TV remote. TV experience. TV. 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 Sports TV. 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 Yeah, that one. The hour-long descent into madness as Xbox sealed its own fate for the eighth generation of consoles by cutting gamers out of the equation. And what do you know? One part of the showcase sounds a little bit familiar. Remedy are world-class storytellers. They have created a revolutionary entertainment experience that weaves a cinematic action of intense gameplay with the tension and drama of scripted television, creating a world where each has a direct impact on the other. Microsoft had partnered with Remedy to develop a video game and a TV show which tell one big simultaneous story. It promises to be a thrilling science fiction adventure which bridges the gap between TV and gaming, creating an entertainment experience which will give them storytelling opportunities outside of the limits of video games. You get the idea. After all, time is a flat circle. But I'm not done. No less than 10 seconds after the reveal of Quantum Break, Remedy's YouTube channel posted this message from the studio's creative director, Sam Lake. I wanted to take a moment to talk to all Alan Wake fans. That's you guys. We are working on something new, something big, which of course means that the next big game from Remedy won't be Alan Wake 2. Even though we worked hard on it, the sequel was not happening. The time wasn't right for that. Sure, we could have gone ahead and created something less ambitious, but we felt that that wouldn't have done justice to you guys, to us. We want to be really proud of everything that we create. And certainly, 
wouldn't have done justice to Alan Wake. With a shaky voice and what sounds like a lump in his throat, he addresses Alan Wake fans directly. Lake tells us that, for now at least, the long-awaited sequel has been shelved. Something else has taken priority. See, Remedy was still owned by Microsoft, making Xbox and PC exclusive games. It wouldn't shrug off those shackles until 2017, which means any game developed had to get approval from Microsoft executives. And the execs wanted an entertainment experience. What was shown to us at the Xbox showcase wasn't indicative of what Quantum Break would become. A little girl clutching a teddy bear speaking to a government agent, being sent away because of her supernatural powers and giving the agent a premonition of a disaster yet to come. It looked cheap, hashed together at short notice to showcase the entertainment experience which encompassed the brand of the Xbox One. Worst of all, none of it would be in the game. Quantum Break, uh, in, in, in many ways, first and foremost, it's a game. It's a, it's a big story-driven cinematic action adventure, kind of. Uh, and, and in many ways, we're taking everything that we have learned from previous games and just raising the bar much higher. What we did get was ambitious and weird and fascinating, and very little about it works the way Remedy hoped it would. In hindsight, the combat serves as a tech demo for what Control would later refine. Despite the likability factor of Sean Ashmore, Jack Joyce is a potato of a protagonist. Despite the game's visuals being slick and cool and the machinations of its time travel having aeons of potential, the sum of its parts undercut it at almost every turn. But unlike Defiance, Quantum Break doesn't deserve to be forgotten to time. Yes, it wasn't the first game to try meld television with gaming, but the ambitious way it did that is a cut above of just having a compromised vision playing every Monday while you shoot stuff. Upon revisiting it, it's hard not to think that this was an accidental but very necessary evil, to show that this idea of replacing a video game with an all-in-one entertainment experience is, quite frankly, a bad one, no matter how well it's executed. So that's what we're going to look at here. Just like a fracture, we're going to tear the game apart to see what's good, what's bad, and to ask the question, does Remedy's techno thriller go beyond its ambitions? This is a commentary and critique of Quantum Break. The number one killer is time. It destroys us all. The first six words out of Jack Joyce's mouth are as poetic as we'd come to expect from a Remedy game. We pick up at the very end, with Jack being interviewed by head of Monarch Security, Clarice Ogawa, recounting the events which led them both here, calmly sipping coffee in a conference room. Ogawa is looking to learn everything she possibly can about Jack's journey, about his powers, about the death of her former boss, but as soon as the tape starts recording, Jack starts waxing lyrical. Going too fast for you? No, Jack, you're going too slow. She brought you here to gather intelligence, so here you recite poetry, you melon. Max Payne and Alan Wake, the heroes of Remedy's previous titles, both saw the world through an exaggerated lens. Max, because he's a hard-boiled crime noir detective in a story that's so meta you'd expect Deadpool to crash through a window at any second, and Alan because he's a writer, something he loves to remind people at any given chance. But Jack Joyce is a nobody, with a capital N. He's the least interesting character in a story he's at the centre of, and even his look, his design, is the least distinctive of any of Remedy's protagonists. In my critique of Control, I claimed that I think Jessie Faden's design worked against her role as an outsider. Her pedestrian clothes and haircut were both missed opportunities to visually present her as the explosive catalyst she ended up being when she reached the FBC. I still stand by that claim, but at least Jessie had her red hair to print her in the player's mind. Jack Joyce makes Jesse Faden look like a Picasso painting. The brown jacket, jeans and sneakers make him blend into the environment to enact a sense of realism and believability, primarily so the transition to live action isn't too jarring, but this sacrifices any chance Jack ever had of becoming iconic. His colours are muted, beige, forgettable, and unfortunately these are all characteristics that describe Jack himself. There's nothing exaggerated or whimsical about him, so as badass as this opening line is, it's both out of character and nonsensical in the scene. And ironically, it may seem like I'm going too slow here, rambling about six little words, but they set up the foundation for Quantum Break's future fumbles. Jack's interview with Ogawa is simply here so the pair can regularly inject the story with hints at things to come, whetting the player's appetite and creating a sense of mystery. However, 
just like a lot of Quantum Break's tone, it feels incredibly forced. Foreshadowing can be a powerful tool to engage your audience. Alan Wake's structure understood this all too well. Finding the manuscript pages, you were teased with future events, told from different perspectives and wrapped up cosily in the prose of a fiction writer. It gave the player more information about the story, but through dint of being pages of a novel, Remedy's writers were able to keep up a palpable sense of suspense. By the time the credits roll, there's no reason to believe Jack would ever cooperate with Monarch. No reason to think he'd put himself in a position where he'd sit quietly in a room with a woman who tried to kill him. No reason for why Jack and Ogawa are being so vague and cagey when they're trading information, other than to force a false sense of mystery around the story. And Quantum Break's premise is interesting enough that it doesn't need this narrative device because the hints are so vague and so open that they come off as meaningless platitudes rather than specific teases. We're jumping ahead here, but there's a perfect example of this in Act 2. Nothing prepared me for the weirdness that was waiting there. And even that was just a prelude to the bad stuff that would follow in that same place later. At this point, the player is about 10 feet away from entering Ground Zero. We're about to see the weird stuff Jack is discussing with the Gawa, so slowing us to a light jog so we can hear the full dialogue of there's weird stuff ahead isn't economic or impactful, it's time wasting, pun intended. But let's rewind again, back to Act 1, the start of the game. Riverport University, here we are. Quantum Break's opening is slow. Very slow, the slowest opening in their development history, involving 20 to 30 minutes of exploring Riverport University and drinking in the world Remedy have meticulously designed. Jack is here to visit his longtime friend, Paul Serene, who wants to show him some scientific marvel he's been working on, but there's an effective overcast of tension as soon as we take control of our hero. The attention to detail that Remedy games are famous for is in full force, especially on a second playthrough. The physics building is looming and garish, the side of it modelled after William Joyce's countermeasure like a wry joke. We journey through the aftermath of a protest gone wrong, finding snippets of information regarding what happened, and setting up our big bad conglomerate Monarch as our villains. Martin Hatch is lurking suspiciously near the entrance without explanation. Liam Burke is armed, dangerous, and waiting to spring into action near the lab. Pretty much every sight we see relates to Monarch as a villainous threat. Almost all of the collectibles connect to the planned demolition of the university library. The tents, littered like a refugee camp, passed out frat boys splayed on the ground, abandoned signs are all a light-hearted way of connecting Monarch's existence with disaster and chaos. And as intrinsic as the setting is, it's Jack's response to it which stands out most. How would you feel if you knew a corporate monopoly was taking a massive dump all over your personal history? Uh, that's quite an opener. What's frustrating is Jack Joyce doesn't stand for anything. He has no opinion on Monarch's tight grip of Riverport or on the protesters. When Amy tries to engage him to learn about the terrible stuff Monarch is doing to the campus, he shrugs it off. We're still in the first hour of the game. The player is trying to figure out who they're playing as, what makes him tick, what his beliefs are. And when faced with an abject situation which most people would have a take on, he moves on with his day. We'll notice this a few times as he trundles through the game's story. Aside from occasional bursts of vengeance rage, he's decidedly neutral on so much of the world he inhabits. Here, after years of globetrotting, he has one sole focus, to speak to Paul. And in fact, the only piece of characterization we can be sure of is that he's reckless and naive, evidenced by the back and forth between the two friends when they finally meet. Protests against Monarch are going strong, I see. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised you didn't join in. I thought that kind of trouble was your forte. Well, it used to be our forte. You're the one that sold out. Paul Serene, on the other hand, should go down in Remedy's Hall of Fame as one of its most interesting characters. If Jack is a faceless mold that takes an entire game to become engaging, Serene is captivating from the offset, as he very much should be. Jack describes him as a showman, and we can see that in the presentation he gives. When we crack a joke during his speech, he snaps at us to not interrupt his flow. Despite the nickname of Moneybags, Paul puts that money where his mouth is, studying enough quantum physics in his spare time to follow the research on time travel. He's not just a rich asshole, he's incredibly fond of Jack and he's made likeable by his openness to admit he doesn't know everything. He makes a sincere point at a few moments in the story to credit William Joyce for his research, but just like this game, he's ambitious, arguably 
too ambitious. In a vacuum, the slow pace of Quantum Break's opening isn't a bad thing. It's here to ease us into the time travel of it all. One thing you can't call the game is simple. Its handling of space-time is imperfect, but it's thorough and complex. In fact, Remedy collaborated with a quantum physicist at CERN to ensure their science fiction had enough, well, science in it. In an interview with Wired, Sam Lake said, We worked with a brilliant physicist, Siski Razanin. He was talking about rotating black holes and particles and gravity wells and how, at a certain point, if you move through space, you're actually moving through time. And that's our time machine, essentially. There is a core. There is a corridor. That was a nice thing to me, that our design is unique. I've never seen anything similar in time travel pop culture. The process of setting up the time machine is slow, yes, but there are a lot of concepts the game needs the player to become familiar with before the wham zap superpower stuff can kick in. How the corridors work, chronon particles, how far back can we go, can paradoxes happen, and most importantly of all, can we change anything? We return to this time machine again and again over the course of the story, and Quantum Break tries to front-load its really important lessons early so it's not beholden to lore dumps every 15 minutes. But there are two problems with this. The first is that these lessons are taught to us through the most boring way imaginable. Walking from console to console, pushing X, staring at incomprehensible diagrams without a comment from our player character. There's no puzzle here, nothing to figure out. We're given all of this information and expected to just absorb it. And the second problem is that Jack hears none of it. Serene throws a bunch of info at him, information which is laid out simply enough that it's pretty easy for him to understand. The player is expected to understand it, but Jack's responses are dense, and by Act 4, it's like he's forgotten what happened in the previous three. Exhibit A of this comes when William Joyce, our estranged brother, enters the scene. Well, you have to help me with this. We have to shut this thing down now. No, 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 stop him! Shut up! Hold, hold, on. The core. Hold, hold on! We can't shut it down, Paul's still in there. The trio are finally gathered. The time machine is about to break down. Paul is about to be blasted back to the past, all because William is frantically trying to stop the experiment, filled with the knowledge of the apocalypse that will cause. And knowledge is what separates Jack from his fellow main characters. If you strip back the timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly stuff, the burden of knowledge is Quantum Break's thematic focus. I don't think it's any accident that the game is bookended with a university somewhat synonymous with knowledge. Neither do I think it's an accident that this opening is set to the backdrop of a library being destroyed, or that later Will, a character who has all the answers to our questions, seemingly dies at the same time that this library is destroyed. There's a lot of really strong thematic focus in this opening that just can't go ignored. Nord. Different characters are granted knowledge about the end of time, and it impacts them in significantly different ways. Will becomes a recluse, isolating himself from his family. Paul's moral compass gets corrupted. Martin Hatch loses all humanity. Beth Wilder falls into a depression. Charlie Wilcott struggles with his self-preservation. Liam Burke spirals out of control. The only character unburdened by the knowledge of the end of time is Jack Joyce. Like every other Remedy protagonist, he's motivated by family ties, but his personality, his character, is unchanged by what he learns. Revelations crash into him like waves off a ship's bow, but he's a static character through to the end, rarely asking questions, but hardly ever understanding what he's learned. What? Why is there an egg in this? He's too dumb for a character arc. Early in development, Remedy initially planned for Quantum Break to feature four playable characters, splitting the story across different perspectives. We haven't managed to grasp any further details, but I think that would have made for a much more engaging tale. The plot of Quantum Break is incredibly interesting. The questions it asks are fascinating, but putting the player in the shoes of a guy like Jack Joyce counterbalances a lot of the game's intrigue. He's most interesting when he's with Will, Beth or Paul, mainly because they suck up the scenery with how they think, how they hypothesize, how they use the knowledge they've learned. The dissonance, yup, we're using the D word, comes from what we're doing during those conversations. Because unlike in, say, Alan Wake, nothing mechanically interesting ever happens while we're traveling with an NPC. Let's take a key example. With the destruction of the time machine, Jack and Will try to escape from the university together. Jack gets a gun, develops a couple of his time powers. The two brothers come across a jammed door. Now, this is our first in-game obstacle that we need to overcome. Bear in mind, we've just unlocked two abilities. 
one stops time and the other unlocks people from being frozen in time. There's a lot you could do with these two basic functions. So, how do Jack and Will get past the blocked door? Do we freeze Will, rewind time to a point when the doors open, unfreeze him and push him through? Do we use our new time blast to just blow it open? Nope, he barges through it with his shoulder. And trust me when I say this, it will not be the last time. Why are you helping me? You're with them. It's more complicated than- Hey look, it's Jesse! Exhibit B of Jack's frustrating inability to ask questions comes with the meeting of Beth Wilder. The relationship between these two carries much of the human drama in Quantum Break, primarily because she's with us for so much of our journey. Beth immediately recognises Jack, calls him by his name, which raises so many questions, but Jack doesn't care. He ditches her in this hallway, off to shoot up some more henchmen in his quest to find Will. And when the brothers finally reunite, Someone else is waiting for them. Think about this. You don't know what's at stake. I know exactly what's at stake. That's why I'm here. You believe you can stop what's coming? I'm giving you one chance to change your mind. This path, it's already said it can't be changed. The past, the future, I've seen it. I've lived it. Paul Serene returns, 16 years older, grey in his hair, and powers similar to Jack's. And for all of my criticism so far, I love the nuance here. Despite being so convinced that he can't change what's to come, Paul is still conflicted about shooting Will, adding a little colour to that grey moral compass he's developed. Yes, he has a gun to Will's head, but there's a real sense of respect here. He knows if Will lives, he's going to be the ultimate obstacle to his plan. He's seen this, and yet he still can't bring himself to murder his old friend in cold blood. Instead, he blows him up along with the library. In the run-up to the game's release, the marketing justified the inclusion of a TV show with the banner, the game's about the heroes, the show's about the villains. Like just concentrating on the game would limit their vision, but we learn more about Paul Serene through the Junction episodes than we ever do from the live action stuff. To almost bridge the gap between running around as Jack and occasionally playing a video game, Remedy applied short five minute inserts where you get to play as Paul Serene instead. All this really involves is walking up a thinly veiled corridor while dialogue happens and then making a choice, but by themselves, they're tightly structured glimpses into Monarch and the way it works. In just a few moments, we learn a whole bunch of things. Number one, Paul can see into the future at will. Number two, he's ill and whenever he uses his powers, it gets worse. Number three, when the time machine exploded, he got sent back to 1999 and has spent the last 16 years creating Monarch, our evil capitalists. Number four, how heavily Paul relies on his right-hand man, Martin Hatch. Number five, the fact that Martin Hatch is ruthless, more so than Paul himself. And number six, Monarch's mission at the university was to steal the core of the time machine. That's not six little details, either. These are all big additions to the story, and despite the junction being so short, it's effective both for the writing and character work undertaken by Aidan Gillen playing Paul and Lance Reddick playing Martin Hatch. My point is, this tells us everything we need to know without a television show. And worse yet, when the writing transitions from in-game to live action, there is a dramatic dip in realism and humanity. That feels pretty cruel to say, I know, writing is hard, who do I think I am? So let me put my time where my mouth is. Let's take a quick intermission to talk about episode one, Monarch Solutions. So uh, you're doing, you have these episodes, essentially episodes that are live action. Yeah. And then you have gameplay. Why bother do, doing that? Why not just do gameplay throughout? Well, I mean... The television show brings our attention to a few characters, but its main focus is on Liam Burke, a thuggish monarch enforcer, Charlie Wilcott, a Weasley monarch hacker, and Fiona Miller, a monarch scientist that I can't think of an adjective for. These three form our main TV trio to contrast our in-game one. Liam was conceived as a dark reflection of Jack, Fiona is a discount Beth, and Charlie fills whatever gap is left by either Amy Ferrero or Nick Marsters, depending on one of your choices. It's no secret that Remedy encountered a lot of challenges when devising the TV show. Microsoft offered up both funding and the resources of its entertainment division to make it. Remedy opted to take the funding but not the resources, reaching out to the production company Lifeboat Productions instead. This proved to be one of the smartest choices that the team 
made because in 2014 Microsoft completely shut down Xbox Entertainment Studios, laying off 18,000 people in the process and discontinuing major projects across the organisation, like a Halo TV show. Thankfully, Remedy had already started working with Lifeboat, so this mammoth shutdown didn't impact the development of Quantum Break's TV shows too much. What did impact the development, however, was the separation of writers. So what the, what's the 411? What the hell's going on out there? <laughs> the 411. Yeah, the 411. <laughs> The overall story of Quantum Break was developed by Sam Lake. The creation of Monarch, the overarching structure of the plot concerning the lifeboat, that was all him, Mikhail Kasurunin, Miko Rotolati, and Tyler Smith. But the scene-to-scene -scene dialogue was handled by Lifeboat's writers, Ron Maybauer, Terry Hughes-Burton, and Josh Corbin. And there's an awkward stiltedness which comes from how our characters speak to each other. Seems your work's been undone. We just lost communication with Jack Joyce's transport. Like here, none of the people who work for Monarch know what the word transport is. It's always transpo, highlighted by the awkward apostrophe put into the subtitles. Contrast that to the game, where we at least get entertaining moments like I just watched a ship fast forward through a fucking bridge. <laughs> what a great line. Episode 1 follows Charlie doing some of his hacker magic while developing a crush on Fiona. We're introduced to an upcoming gala that Monarch is hosting, and she invites him along, much to his surprise. Paul Serene and Martin Hatch clunk along in a warehouse together for barely 60 seconds, discussing a potential traitor which has cropped up in Monarch, and introducing us to the tension which lies between our two big bads. But this scene, the one which should be the most entertaining, most enthralling moment of the episode, teaches us nothing we don't already know about the two characters or the plot. We've already seen this tension during the Junction episode. We've already learned that Paul Serene can see into the future. You've been the face of Monarch for all these years, Martin. But let's get clear on something. This is still my ship. And it's not helped that all potential tension is diffused by Aidan Gillen and Lance Reddick smirking their way through the entire argument, like they find every word they're forced to say utterly laughable. Meanwhile, Liam Burke spends seven full minutes floating around his house hearing about his pregnant wife's bizarre dreams. This scene is the first hint that we have that Burke is beginning to doubt Monarch's work, questioning if maybe they're secretly up to some bad stuff, but that's rushed away in one line of dialogue when we're forced to listen to this. I dreamt you were a cat. What is happening? It's clear that the television writers thought this was some beautiful, haunting setup to a later scene in episode 3 when Emma Burke sees her husband for the brutal henchman he is. Her dream about him being a huge animal is capitalized on when he grabs her in a bear hug and explains his entire character to her after violently murdering a hitman in a hospital. I'm telling you, I never felt good doing this. I, I never, I never felt good doing this. But it's the only thing I knew how to do. The one new piece of information we learn in episode one is that after Jack Joyce was captured by Monarch, someone drove his truck off to a warehouse to try and rescue him. All set up for act two of the game. Burke tracks down the truck and finds Beth Wilder in the midst of rescuing our hero. She tells him that time is coming to an end and Monarch has been preparing for it with something called the Lifeboat Protocol. And with eight minutes left in episode one and Burke deciding to turn on Monarch, we're introduced to the TV show's favorite word across the one hour 40 minutes of its dialogue. Fuck you. How the fuck does that happen? Shut the fuck up, Brenner. What the fuck is that? The fuck is it doing on my desk, Brenner? Get the fuck out of my office. Fuck, Beth. Anyone who's watched my other videos will know I'm hardly a tight arse when it comes to swearing, but what I just played you was barely 10% of the fuckery we get across the TV episodes. In fact, episode 1 has more F-bombs than the entire game combined. I know, I checked. So when your high-octane time-babble techno-thriller is fused with an edgy teenager's action script, you begin to disconnect from the characters. It's really tough to take Liam Burke's redemption arc or Descent into Darkness seriously when it's coloured with scenes like this. Burke, listen, if I have to come in there, you're gonna fucking regret it. Listen, this is just a big misfucking understanding I'm gonna be out tomorrow. Oh, what a good word for you. I will help you climb this ladder. All I'm asking is please let me take a fucking shit. There's so much more to talk about with the episodes, the effects, the action scenes, remedies, struggles, cooperating with Lifeboat, but we're going to save that for now and focus on choices and consequences instead. Because as ambitious an idea as this is, it comes with some necessary technical limitations which completely diminish the impact of the TV show. So first, back to the game. Hello, 
Helsinki. How are you doing? I'm Sam Lake, the creative director of Remedy. Instead of doing a boring presentation about music in Remedy games, we decided to slow jam it to you. This clip doesn't have anything to do with what I'll talk about here, I just wanted to include it because I love it so much. Sam Lake is so cool, man. Act 2 rollicks along with a collection of warehouses and baddies to fight. We get a new enemy type, unlock a new time power, and experience a visually striking set piece as Jack hunts for Paul across a dockyard covered in conveniently placed chest high walls. But I'm not interested in all that. What I'm interested in is how the game's just evolved because of the choice Paul Serene made back in Junction 1. When faced with a captured Amy Ferrero, Paul is able to look into the future and catch a glimpse of what happens next. Choice 1 is to let them go but force Amy to record a false PR message, labelling Jack Joyce a terrorist and ensuring the city of Riverport rallies around Monarch. Choice 2 is to kill Amy and her friends. It means that there will be no witnesses to their stealing the Time Machine Corps, but the city of Riverport will turn against Monarch. This happens four times over the span of the game. Kill Amy or don't kill Amy. Give a speech or don't give a speech. Trust Sophia Amaral or Martin Hatch. Give in to paranoia or stay rational. This first choice, however, is probably the most impactful one in the game. If we keep Amy alive, Jack meets her while exploring the warehouse. The two team up, work together, and she eventually joins our team and helps fight Monarch. A radio host who was critical of Monarch back in Act 1 is suddenly replaced by someone who just loves Paul Serene and Martin Hatch and thinks time-travelling capitalists are good actually, if you think about it actually. Later, when Jack is on the run, bystanders will alert guards to his location because they think he's a criminal. Alternatively, if we kill Amy, she dies, erased from the rest of the game. She doesn't join Team Joyce, instead a new character, the incredibly funny Nick Marsters, joins the fray. The radio host keeps calling out Monarch and the bystanders well, they still alert the guards to your location, they just do it by accident. But the details of Quantum Break's world reflect your choices too. Anti-monarch graffiti covers walls if you turn the city against them. The email correspondence you can find is altered as well, referring to different events. Hell, the music on that radio station I mentioned switches up depending on who's hosting the show. The guards we creep by will discuss how uncomfortable they are with the death of the students. Most of these are injected so fluidly into the game world that you likely won't realise these are direct consequences to your choice, and some collectibles are even locked behind different choices. It's all optional flavour text, but it does mean that true depth and understanding of the story requires two playthroughs. All of this is incredibly impressive, and a testament to the narrative rabbit holes Remedy can send the player down as they lead you through their story. But the world's own rules cause one weird problem when it comes to choice and consequence. How did you... You're the taxi guy. You drove me to university. What is all this? They're killing everybody. In this playthrough, I sacrificed Amy, meaning I got to spend time with my new best friend, Nick. He's a conspiracy theorist who believes that Riverport is haunted by a ghost uprising or something, and bless him, if control is anything to go by, there's a solid chance he's right. But allying ourselves with him goes against everything we have learned and everything we will learn about time travel. Nothing can be changed. That is the mantra of Quantum Brick. We're reminded of it again and again. Time is a flat circle. What happens will always happen, no matter what we try to do. Sometimes, the game raises questions about the validity of that mantra, about whether or not it's true, but the game provides an overwhelming amount of evidence to fix it as the ultimate rule. In Act 5, when Jack thinks that he's gone back in time to save Will, he learns that Will always survived. He changed nothing. Everything Paul Serene sees during the Junction episodes comes true. None of them deviate. When Beth goes back to 1999, she tries to change a whole heap of stuff from 9-11 to the death of Jack's parents, but they happen every single time. Monarch already exists prior to Paul travelling back in time to create the company. There's a set loop. Paul always creates monarchs. So and side note, for some reason Paul made the logo of his company a monarch butterfly as a cute nod to the butterfly effect. This is the idea that one small change, like killing a butterfly, can have far-reaching consequences and change the future. Which makes no sense, because Paul's defining philosophy is that nothing can be changed. But anyway, according to Quantum Break, the journey might deviate slightly, but the destination will always be the same. There are set big moments which will always come to pass. But Paul's choices raise a problem with this, or rather, the first choice does. 
Our choice directly changes Amy Ferrero's future. If we choose to kill her, then her time is cut short. She dies. Her death is a big moment for her. This is the end of her existence. Dying during Jack's adventure isn't something which will always happen. Either she survives the events of the game, or we kill her through our choice. Paul and the player look into the future and we don't change one small detail like whether or not to give a bloody speech, we change the entire destination of a person's existence. It would be different if Amy dies by the time the credits roll regardless, that would follow the rules, but she doesn't. She jogs off to live out her life after Monarch is taken down. For Amy Ferrero, Junction 1 changes everything about her future. Concurrent the others to the Ground Zero operation. Make it quick. Painless. In my critique of Guardians of the Galaxy, I discussed how not every player choice needs to have far-reaching consequences which spread tendrils into the fates of characters. Sometimes, the illusion of choice is enough to encourage a player to climb into the headspace of who they're controlling. But unfortunately, through dint of being a time travel story, Quantum Break is an exception to that. If you're inviting a player to pick up a controller and make a life or death choice in your plot about how time can't be changed, then that puts the player in a position of godlike authority, separate from the game world. We're not experiencing these junction choices as Paul, we're experiencing them as the writer or director of the story. We clearly see what the consequences will be of what we choose, and that does detach us from the emotional stakes. At the end of this act, we have to choose if Paul gives a speech or if he interrogates Jack. Because the death of Amy or Nick has conditioned us to not be empathetic with our decision making, we start to think about the consequences in a meta sense, rather than what will be best for Jack. What do we want to see? I bet watching Sean Ashmore and Aidan Gillen locked in a room will be cool, let's pick that. Worse yet, the final two Junction moments typically ask the player to ignore what they've already learned. When we need to decide to trust Martin Hatch or Sophia Amaral, the game and TV show have made it 100% clear that Hatch is a baddie and Sophia is loyal to Paul. The only reason we would choose to trust Hatch would be to see what happens or to make Paul's life harder. The same goes for the final choice. We choose if we want to give Paul his medicine or not, and if you're anything like me, you'll choose not to because you think it'll increase the chance of seeing one of the monstrous shifters in action. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. I don't want to harp on about immersion breaking in a time travel game, but the way choices and consequences are engineered means just like the TV show, their inclusion was kind of doomed from the outset because of the nothing changes mantra. It's always fun to pick A or B and see how the game reacts, but any chance of resolution resonating emotionally with our characters is sacrificed as a result, and that's a damn shame. Fighting through the dockyard, Jack learns about the Monarch Gala later that night. He speaks to Paul, who reiterates that no matter what, Jack's going to hand himself over to Monarch before the day is over, and we finally get to see one of the corporation's big secrets. Ground Zero the source of their time travel tech, and the prime example that nothing can be changed. And it's here that Jack sees both the future and the past, captured in one moment. Come with me. I can survive this. You're the only other one who's seen what I've seen. Oh, no, I don't. He sees Beth and Paul pointing guns at each other, trapped in 2010, but he also hears himself two days from now in 2016, begging Paul Serene not to hurt Beth. Bizarrely, both moments are happening simultaneously, and as we'll learn in Act 4, they will always happen. They cannot be changed. We wander through an infinitely looping room. Time fast forwards, rewinds, pauses, leaps ahead, jumps back, all dynamically and without a cutscene. Will, a shadow of Will from the past, desperately tinkers over cluttered desks and screens to complete his design of something. Something we'll later learn is his countermeasure to the end of time the one thing that will be able to save the world. The visual language of time is Quantum Break's greatest achievement. Even with how critical I've been, there's something truly awe-inspiring about how the team were able to shape and shift its landscape to create such a consistent art style and feeling from when time breaks down. Even though the world will regularly freeze around the player, it doesn't feel static. There's constant movement in how the ground ripples beneath our feet, or spaces start to shatter and reform at a moment's notice. This is all purposeful. While Paul Serene and Monarch form our antagonists to shoot a machine gun at, it's time, the tangible force of time, which is truly the enemy here. When it loses control, it becomes an unhinged monster devouring everyone. It's like Jack said at the start of the game, the number one killer is time. And when we experience the stutters, we feel that. 
There's an aching sense of danger in how time is visually presented to us, because it's not just that the world freezes, it's how reality flits in and out of being. Remedy turned to photographs for inspiration. After all, how else do you capture something trapped in time than through the tiny portable lenses we all carry in our pockets? The colour grading changes, influenced by infrared photography. Objects which were once round suddenly have jagged, sharp edges bursting out of them like they're disintegrating. Jack and the player feel so displaced and isolated because the audio is filtered, giving us a sense of being trapped underwater. Now if only the gameplay lived up to the visuals. All of the meticulous craftsmanship that was poured into making the Time Fractures look so ominous and threatening gets thrown out of the window when you usher Jack through the game's set pieces. With a straightforward corridor and thinly veiled quick time events, moments like jumping over a crumbling bridge or racing through an exploding dockyard suddenly expose themselves for what they are, walking simulators. Follow the yellow brick concrete, press Y to remove an obstacle, occasionally freeze an object so you can jump on it. It doesn't matter how many times Jack shouts, oh shit, and something stutters into place, the lack of thinking required from the player during these set pieces is what holds them back. There is never combat while you try to navigate a perilous environment. There's never a puzzle to be cracked before time resets. Jack Joyce is caught in the middle of time folding in on itself, and the player puts as much thought into navigating the wreckage as they would pushing Nathan Drake up a cliff. The visual language is all about chaos and danger, but the gameplay language is all about pushing up on the analog stick. You could argue that this is on purpose. Remedy would rather the player absorb the twitching, angular breakdown of reality than overthink what they need to do, but the puzzle design in other parts of the game don't help that argument. But we'll get there in a later act, because Jack, Beth and Nick have finally united and formed our trio. They're off to the Bradbury swimming pool to see what Will hid there before his death, and we've got 30 minutes of walking to clock in before the act is over. I know your brother built the one thing that can stop the fracture. I know we're meant to find it, but I know Monarch doesn't want us to. And yet you're wearing their uniform. I like the way their pants fit. In 2016, at the Nordic Games Conference, Gregory Loudon, the senior narrative designer of Quantum Break, discussed the process for designing the game's narrative. Because of the complexity of the story, he designed a game timeline to help map out the pacing of Jack's adventure. Quote, I used this to look at the game, look at the gameplay variety, and look at the pacing. Pacing is the most important thing in a story, and I could look at my chart and see the issues. I could see if there was too much combat back to back, and if we needed to put in a story level. Where does the combat go? Are there enough puzzles in Act 2? Is there enough downtime for the characters to collect their thoughts? Does the player experience stutters enough to make them feel like a looming threat? All relevant questions, and questions that Gregory Loudon regularly asked. But at a fair few moments in the game, the answers have made things worse. The swimming pool is the perfect example. It's the final third of Act 2. We've had some combat-heavy battles to wade through, the player has geared into the shooty shooty bang bang part of their brain for almost an hour now, so the story decides to slow right down. This allows us to trace the distinct lack of trust between Jack and Beth. The two clearly have distinct opposing philosophies and are reluctantly working together. Beth believes we can't change the past, Jack disagrees. We find a spooky tape from Will where he addresses Beth directly, addressing her as a friend despite the fact she's never met him, and it clearly bothers Jack that Will was able to confide in someone other than him. But this isn't the most interesting part. Is that? Yeah, I think so. The second time machine. This changes everything. The environmental artists at Remedy really get to flex their muscles with the design of the swimming hall. Everything is in contrast to Paul Serene's own high-tech lab. The machine is a skeleton of Paul's. Ropes and tubing skirt the shot of this grand reveal. That popping yellow colour which appears over and over is peeled and aged, baked into the walls rather than shiny and new. It's a space which tells us something we already know, but that something is still powerful when it's shown as confidently as this. That Jack and his friends 
are the underdogs. But as cool in design as a swimming hall is, it just strengthens the disconnect between the game's visual storytelling and its mechanical storytelling. Just like Paul's experiment in Act 1, just like the fracture set piece in Act 2, the 20 to 30 minutes spent in the swimming hall is a long, slow slog through an unnecessary lore dump, and according to Gregory Loudon, it's like this to balance out all the action so far, but structure-wise, it's so fucking boring. It's interesting that Gregory Loudon used the term story levels in his talk, because the most effective game stories are the ones which aren't so obvious when they separate their gameplay from their character beats. I'd argue that as a design philosophy, story levels shouldn't be anywhere near a game's development. Alan Wake bookended its episodes with slow-paced walking sections to set up a slow crawl of tension before night hit and madness descended on Alan. They formed about 30 minutes of an 8-hour game total. Quantum Break doesn't seem to understand what tension is or why it's important. The initial buzz of excitement a player might feel at finding the time machine gets cut to pieces when it's followed with walking around Will's lab, shoulder barging a door, reading emails, and interacting with four terminals to try and get the machine working. You're not allowed to use your powers here, which clearly slices the lore bits from the game bits, and means that you can't just dash across the hall to the next terminal, you need to clumsily angle your way around the swimming pool instead. This happens three times during the span of the game. 3. Doing it once at the start of Act 1 was already too much, but it could at least be forgiven because of all the time travel rules it was teaching us. Stretching it out a second time, and then a third in Act 4 shows that Remedy poured all of its storytelling ambition into other places, and hoped that the plot would carry through its slow beats. But I'm sorry to say, it doesn't. No, 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 no. What? God damn it. I don't know. We're so close. And after all this, the time machine doesn't even work! Remedy's game timeline overcompensates, meaning that when Quantum Break's 7-8 to eight hours are up, you have passively experienced the game more than you've played it. Writing this script, I can see into the future so I can tell you don't believe me, but don't worry, with Act 2 coming to an end and Jack handing himself over to Paul so he can get close to Sophia Amaral, we can take the slow story dump of Junction 2 and calculate the game's engagement factor with maths. You are right. My visions of the future aren't always clear, but they don't lie. Here's a spreadsheet I made. Sexy, I know. Quantum Break's entertainment experience can be divided into six camps. Cutscenes. I just watched a ship fast forward through a fucking bridge. Combat. The TV show. Walking sections. Solving puzzles. And fracture set pieces. Each TV episode runs for an average of 24 minutes. Four of these makes 96 minutes. I know, maths. But let's round it down to 1.5 hours to simplify and add on the in-game cutscenes that clock in at just over two hours. There are two fractured set pieces in the game, the dockyard and the bridge, which have a combined playtime of about 10 minutes according to my footage and the playthrough of YouTuber Radbrad. Using that same playthrough, we can calculate how much time is spent on combat, approximately an hour and 20 minutes with dying included. I know, maths, but hey, let's say you're worse than Brad and me at action games. So let's chuck in an extra 10 minutes in there to form a nice, cosy hour and a half. Then we need to look at the puzzles. There are 15 in total in the entire game, making up 12 minutes of playtime. But Monty, you say, that's less than a minute per puzzle, and you'd be right. We'll talk about the puzzles in part 4, but so you keep following me, let's break away from the maths for a second to show you why Quantum Break's puzzles take less than a minute. Roll the clip. Riveting stuff. Let's total up our playtime. One and a half hours for the TV show, two hours of cutscenes, ten minutes for set pieces, one and a half hours for combat, twelve minutes of puzzles. We're hitting five hours and twenty-two minutes, but wait, I thought this was a seven-hour game. Where does the rest of the time go? Here, it goes here. Two hours and seven minutes of walking around while lore is dumped on Jack. This isn't even the full extent of it. I'm not factoring any of the reading that's expected of you while you're walking around. I'm not including the fact that an easy 5% of your playtime is spent standing in elevators, yet still the majority of your game is spent strolling around at a leisurely pace. I know this because I counted it all up and put it in a spreadsheet. I know. 
Maths. We don't need to get as granular as this for Quantum Break's glaring pacing issues to become obvious, but hey, it's my video, let me have my fun. Combat and puzzles are the only two camps which could fairly be considered as thought-provoking gameplay here, and when you combine them, they still make up less than a third of Quantum Break's runtime. Hell, even if you cut out the TV show altogether, there's still a gross imbalance of player involvement, despite Remedy's emphasis on player choice and consequence. So, let's check in on the TV show and discuss those choices and those consequences. They're losing their effectiveness. They're fine. Specifically showing us how weak Paul's illness makes him and his affinity for his doctor, Sophia Amaral, adds a lot of much needed empathy for our villain. Up until now, he seemed completely in control of every scene, from Will's death to his debate with Martin Hatch, so it's important that we see him on the back foot to add more grey to our big bad. Of course, a TV show wasn't necessary to show us this but it's nice that it's here. Episode 2 mainly follows the monarch Gala, introducing us to our party island before we blow it all to hell in the next act. Charlie Wilcott is on his date with Fiona, and Liam Burke is locked in a bunker nearby, arrested for turning against Monarch. If you choose for Paul to give his speech, Martin Hatch will interrogate Jack with a good old-fashioned villain monologue while our hero drools all over the cell. Yet, surprisingly, after said monologue, Hatch lets Jack go with a sly wink and a nod, fully aware that Jack is going to blow the gala to hell. He's a regular sci-fi Iago to Paul's Othello, showing us clearly that Hatch is working against Paul but his motives aren't clear to us yet. Originally, the live-action stuff was kept completely separate from the game. There wasn't going to be any crossover, Jack and Paul wouldn't appear whatsoever, and instead we'd follow a secondary story disconnected from the main one. This seemed sensible, but it was a little too close to what Tryon had attempted with Defiance, and we all saw how that turned out. So, Sam Lake ambitiously pushed to make the game and the TV show have direct connections so it can form one seamless experience. The most obvious way to do this wasn't just to have characters which crossed over, but to have our choices impact the TV show directly. According to Remedy, there are over 40 variations in total for the TV episodes, a combination of your junction choices and finding little environmental tidbits during gameplay. For example, Jack can find this dinosaur cutout at Ground Zero during Act 2. Interacting with it makes it glitch out and vanish, flying across time and space to end up on the outskirts of the party during the TV show. To return to Greg Loudon, the senior narrative designer described them as unlocking deleted scenes for the live action stuff, giving the audience momentary asides or unique shots they would otherwise miss. These are cute, but that's the extent of it. In Act 1, we can find a formula on a whiteboard that Will corrects. Our reward for seeking this out is... Over the lab at the university this morning. Someone saw the equation. Huh? Yup, a five second scene where one guy tells another guy that someone changed my formula last night and the story moves on. But thematically, these are further proof that nothing can be changed and the butterfly effect doesn't operate in Quantum Break's universe. As for the junction choices, these are much more impressive. A lot of them have expected immediate consequences, like if we force Amy to make a PR statement, we witness a full scene of it being filmed, and then it pops up on news reports later. That choice then ripples into the day-to-day -day workings of each of the characters, like how Charlie needs to hack the mayor's PA because Monarch are now struggling with public perception. But the coolest part is how these choices culminate. The fate of Sophia Amaral doesn't rely on one choice, but a couple. If Paul chooses not to trust her at the end of Act 3, and then gives in to his paranoia in Act 4, we are treated to a violent scene where he murders the woman he loves. However, if we combine these choices in pretty much any other way, Sophia's life is spared. Of course, this raises the same problem as Amy's death does, but you've got to admire the level of work that went into making our decisions feel impactful, and it does make the TV show feel more seamless with our gameplay. Over there. Where? The woman with the necklace. Uh, My money is on that. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. It's a pretty good choice, yeah. but I'm gonna have to go with Ryan Gosling down there talking with George Clooney, wearing his nice cufflinks, chatting about stocks. Yeah. 
So in a few minutes, Charlie and Fiona are going to leave the party and go for a nice woodland walk in the dark, where Liam Burke will ambush them and force them to take him to Monarch's secret lab. But before we get to that, let's jump back to this scene because I need to ask, what drinking game are they playing? So they're just sitting with martinis, people watching. They clock a glamorous woman with a costume shop necklace chatting to some old guy. Fiona bets that she'll do something. But Charlie disagrees. He puts his money on some Ryan Gosling guy with nice cufflinks. They take a second, the glamorous woman checks her phone, and Fiona loses her shit. She's so happy about this and makes Charlie down his drink. Why? What game is this? What are the rules, Fiona? Why is the writing so b- Wait, uh, what's- what- what's happening? Why did- why did my footage freeze? Well, this at least brings me on to the big fat technical limitations which are inevitable with a project like Quantum Break. Because of the 40 variations, and the gameplay, and the episodes, and the expensive graphics rendered to make the transition between cutscene and TV less jarring, Quantum Break forces the player to stream the live action stuff, rather than package it into one game file. So, guess what happens when the episode stutters and dies because your internet's having a bad day? That's right, you need to come out of the game wait for a more stable connection, jump back into the game, and then skirt through the episode to find your place. Xbox, watch TV. As the episode comes to a close, Quantum Break plays its most interesting hand. Burke, Fiona, and Charlie break into the lab of Dr. Kim, a leading physicist who is working on Monarch's doomsday protocol, the lifeboat. Kim mysteriously died in 2011, and since then, his lab has been shut down. But what the gang find is fascinating and terrible, and opens the door to so many interesting ideas that unfortunately were saved for a sequel that never came. Through exposure to chronon particles, time travel, radiation, Dr. Kim has been transformed into a shifter. From this point on, these creatures will be teased and teased until there's nothing left to tease. When the end of time comes, some people will be transformed into them, and they'll stalk their prey, freezing them in time and tearing them apart in the process. The suspense around these monsters is palpable. We read research documents on them, we see one trapped in a chamber in the show, we hear Paul and Beth talk about them with such visceral fear that any player even vaguely invested in Quantum Break's story will be excited for the inevitable boss fight to come, and if you've played the game or followed along with this video, you know that that never, ever comes. Reviews were kind to Quantum Break's combat when it first came out, but in retrospect it feels like a stylish, slick, and incredibly clumsy tech demo for the power fantasy we would eventually get with Control. Much like other facets of the game, the problem here can't be boiled down to one issue, but rather a consistent sprinkling of underbaked and sluggish ideas. Thanks for showing up. Here, I thought this was going to be a rescue. Quantum Break was delayed a full year, unfortunately nudging it out of 2015 and into 2016, pitting it as THE Xbox exclusive to match PlayStation's Uncharted 4. This meant that comparisons were abound, and while both are explosive action adventures, Quantum Break's movement and battles unfortunately felt stuck in the past when compared to his competition that quarter. The shocking thing is Remedy has never stood still when it comes to its creativity. It's always been an ambitious studio. The Max Payne sequels iterated upon each other, Alan Wake formed a fresh, new experience unlike anything they'd ever created, and Quantum Break tried to fuse the two to form a brand new action game with a twist. I never thought I'd make this comparison, but Jack Joyce, despite being a time-travelling superhero, feels more like Alan Wake to control than Max Payne or Jesse Faden. There's a bizarre delay in trying to angle him around a battlefield, meaning he comes across as sluggish and wonky when what you want to feel is fast and powerful. I'm definitely not the first to comment on this, but there's no crouch button despite arenas being littered with cover to duck behind. It's all automatic, relying on Jack to be reactive enough to hunker down when you want him to, and and leap out to attack when you're ready to be aggressive. He takes a full TV episode to clamber over walls, and his jump simulates a lack of responsiveness that could be forgiven in Alan Wake just because clumsy controls don't always hamper a horror experience. But Quantum Break isn't a horror, it's a superhero origin story, and most of the time, Jack doesn't feel very super. Act 3 is the most combat-heavy part of the game, so it reinforces all of this. 
Jack has found himself on Paul Serene's private island. The gala is in full swing half a mile away. He needs to fight through what can only be described as a badass Bond lair to reach Sophia Amaral, because she has a way to fix the good guy's time machine. Barely a minute into the act, we're given our final power, Time Rush. And it's awesome, but it's also the only sprint function that we have. Unless we're using our powers to dash or rush, Jack is stuck lumbering about the battlefield like a donkey on Valium, and you don't want to waste your powers just to hurry forwards a couple of feet. That would be both a waste and you can't control the distance of the dash, so you'll always overshoot. This is fine, but what isn't is that you can't jump during time rush and your dash won't carry over holes in the floor, adding to just how unagile Jack feels in our hands. And agility isn't the only problem with combat, but if I had one wish in six months in an oven, it's definitely where I'd focus my attention. Remedy clearly got the memo because control solves this problem tenfold. And if you want to hear more about that, the link to my critiques below. And hey, while you're at it, fancy dropping a like and subscribing? Jack has a full handful of powers at his disposal, so it's not like Remedy are being stingy with what Superboy can do. He can freeze pockets of reality, dash, time rush, bring up a shield, and time blast to blow enemies away. But there is a lack of variety in what these powers do on the battlefield, and almost all of them are in service to the lackluster gunplay, because Jack's lack of versatility ranges to melee combat as well. A sprint function isn't the only thing locked behind Time Rush, punching someone in the face is as well, careening into slow motion so we can get a nice satisfying crack to the jaw. But there are so many moments during fights when you wish you could just smack a soldier in the face with the butt of your gun, but the game doesn't let you, meaning you need to aim down your sights when they're close enough to kiss. When it comes to the shoot 'em up aspects, Monarch's goons are incredibly spongy. Some of the standard soldiers can take a full magazine of bullets to the face before they go down, and this is all to force the player to use their powers. For example, using time freeze and then shooting into that freeze increases the amount of damage you can give, but it doesn't change just how sporadic the gunplay is. Adding to just how cumbersome Jack feels to control, firing a gun is pure unbridled chaos. Shots will skitter off at 90 degree angles if you're not careful, and less than 50% of your shots will hit enemies unless you're breathing down their necks. It's like Jack is eternally hip firing, which is ironic because that isn't something he can do either. Regularly, you'll be down in cover, hiding from lethal sniper shots and soldiers will flank you. Fantastic. The natural reaction here would be to stay crouching and cut those soldiers down, but because there's no hip fire and no ability to toggle when you crouch, Jack will always pop up from behind his cover to shotgun a guy in arm's reach. Worse yet, the ammo capacity of every gun is so low and Jack's reloading animation is so long that you'll spend more time retreating to refill your weapon than you will blasting behind enemies and blowing them away. It's in the bowels of Monarch's labs that we meet our final enemy type, the Juggernaut. These guys are walking tanks, forming the closest thing to boss fights the game ever gets. They're invulnerable at the front, but luckily have exhaust vents in their back that we can shoot at to knock them down. Better yet, they're wearing chronon harnesses, so you can't freeze them in time, relying on the dash and time rush to speed around them instead. This use of enemies is something Quantum Break gets so, so right that I just wish they did more with it. The enemy variety is frustratingly lacking overall, with just four types to fight. Grunts, heavies, strikers, and juggernauts. Despite Monarch clearly working on new experimental tech, mech suits, and drones, and don't get me started on the shifter. But the combat scenarios we do get feel distinct and focused. You can't just run into each fight and use time blast to blow the baddies away. Strikers and juggernauts are immune to being slowed down, so you need to rely on your other powers to get around and blast them from the back. Some arenas have two levels, so your spatial awareness is key, using time vision to check if any henchmen are lurking on the walkways above. There are snipers which sit so far away that you need to use time rush and dash to run up narrow corridors and hide out of their line of sight. Remedy do a lot with the little enemy variety they give us, meaning that combat will often be frustrating and clumsy, but never ever boring. But there are still so many missed opportunities to raise these fights to Remedy's best. There are some slick sections during battle where time will occasionally freeze, meaning Monarch soldiers won't be able to move, but you are free to gallivant around the arena for a few precious seconds. These are as stylish as any other part of the game, with gravel and concrete rippling around Jack, but we can't do anything with these moments. We can't use them to our advantage. 
If an enemy is caught in a fracture, then they become invincible. There's a promise of being able to rewind objects in motion to have them crash into bad guys over and over again, like back in Act 2 with a truck that crashed through a gate. Or maybe we could blow up one of these conspicuous red barrels for a big boom and then rewind time to make it explode a second time. Or maybe we could freeze a grenade an enemy tosses at us and then unfreeze it so it blows up in their face. Or maybe there could be mechanisms like cranes or pulleys which we can fast forward to collide with monarch soldiers. Or maybe or maybe. The opportunities are endless, but what Jack can interact with, what he can capitalize on, is always entirely contextual. One spanner the game throws into the works to keep things interesting are the Chronon dampeners, and for all of my bitching so far, this is the most annoying part. At a handful of moments, these devices will be set up in arenas and prevent Jack from using his powers. So, here's a riddle for you. What happens when you take a superpower action game, combined with a terrible third-person shooter, and get rid of the superpower action game? That's right, you demote the game to a terrible third-person shooter. Now remember, there isn't a lot of combat in Quantum Break, just 90 minutes worth, so you can't justify taking some of those minutes and turning them into full combat scenarios where you don't get to use your very cool powers. But that's exactly what Quantum Break does three times. You need to kill all the minions and then deactivate the tower. Oh sure, you can deactivate the tower before you kill the bad guys if you want, if you can find five seconds where you're not being shot at. Later in the game, the enemies can throw dampener grenades at you which momentarily cancel out your powers, or there are big heavies with small range dampeners attached to their back. These are really really cool. They force Jack to keep moving and not rely on staying in cover, but full situations where the chronon dampener is the central focus of the fight end up feeling both lethargic and annoying, and you end up cursing Remedy for designing it this way, more than enemies you're meant to be fighting. Oh, why are you like this? I know how negative this section has been so far. I really want to love Quantum Break's combat, but every time I look for something to assess, all I can find is tedium and shortcomings when Jack has a gun in his hand. There's gotta be something in here, um... Hmm. Well, while I find something, let's pick the story back up. Jack reunites with Beth at the gala. A fracture's happened, so everyone, including Beth, is now frozen in time. But don't worry, Jack managed to get his hands on one of the Cronon harnesses, which stop you from being affected by time. So he unfreezes Beth, and she puts it on so she can be more present during the cool time set pieces. The pair set off for Sophia Amaral's high-tech bungalow and find her frozen, moments from being gunned down by a combat drone hijacked by Martin Hatch. Let's get to it, though. Wait, what? Oh no. Let's get me going. It's ready. I mean... You! You're Jack Joyce. You're here to kill me. No, but you're coming with us. We need your expertise. This is one of the cutscenes Remedy and Microsoft paraded at conferences to show how gorgeous Quantum Break looked on next-gen hardware. It presents Jack and Beth as a partnership now, not necessarily working together reluctantly anymore, but instead united in their mission to save the world. Oh wait, wait, I found something I like about combat! Each time power has a separate cooldown. Rather than share their use across one force bar like Control did later, Remedy made a point of managing each of Jack's abilities independently. I love this because it forces the player to experiment with a range of options during combat, and it also means that you should always have a time power ready to use should you want to. Even when you're facing enemies like the Strikers, who render your time stop useless, you can still rely on more than one power to take them down, despite the separate cooldowns. For example, both Time Rush and Time Dash offer up similar outcomes. You can momentarily lose the enemy and skip around their back for a couple of good shots. But that's the extent of it, because while we're talking about the powers, there's another issue I've got to raise. The skill tree. Unlike Control, Quantum Break thankfully doesn't rely on a garbage loot or goot system to force the player to spend hours in equipment menus crafting useless upgrades which give you feeble boosts to your character build. I appreciate the simplicity in having one skill tree to focus our efforts on, but simple doesn't have to mean unimaginative, and unfortunately that's all your upgrades are here. They can vary from making your big time blast slightly bigger to increasing the range of your time vision. Ooh. Enhancing Jack's powers requires the player to seek out time shards during gameplay. These little buggers are refractions of light that the player might miss if they're not looking for them, and they're regularly found off the beaten path. The issue is that the limitations of the upgrade system don't exactly incentivize us to hunt down the shards. Most upgrades require a minimum of four to unlock, and some even require six. 
There's a frigidness to the game's upgrade economy, even if it's only as deep as a puddle. This thing growing inside me. I've been fighting it for six hard years. With Beth and Jack capturing Sophia and taking her back to their lair at the swimming pool, Paul starts to crumble. Sophia wasn't just a woman that he cared for deeply, she was the only one who could manufacture his treatments, to keep his Cronon syndrome at bay. This explains why Martin Hatch hacked that drone to kill her. With no treatments, Paul would continue to deteriorate, and it's already begun. We see a flash of what a dangerous creature he could be if he transformed into a shifter. When he attacks Hatch, furious that they let Jack and Beth get away, we're reminded of the cool, calm detachment of his right-hand man, refusing to hurt Paul, even though he obviously could. But the key reveal of this junction happens right at the beginning. We see Will's countermeasure, the one thing that could prevent the end of time, is actually with Paul. He's had it this whole time. This isn't explicitly stated until later, but if you've paid attention to the world design, to some of Will's files and diagrams, a discerning player should be able to recognise it as our big, fat MacGuffin that we have been looking for. And as excited as I am to talk about Quantum Break's world design, we gotta return to the TV show first, so let's look at the action and direction of Episode 3. Then we get the finished live action, like raw footage to the Remedy office, and we're looking at like, so why is there like a white boxed lamp in the live action? Because they, they literally thought that this untextured white lamp in the content we sent to them is something that should be in the live action. So you see this beautiful live action, then there's like a blank white lamp there. It actually looks like it kind of lo should be there, but we were like, that's that's just, why why is that there? It is a goddamn miracle that the game and the show managed to seem together like it did when you hear about the friction behind the scenes. Every interview with the Quantum Break team, written or otherwise, has a clear tone of good-naturedness. They understood the mammoth undertaking of combining television with video games, but the final product indicates that the TV side didn't really understand how to overcome that undertaking. Regardless of the funding from Microsoft, the TV show looks cheap, and even the in-game clips directed by the television team have a real dip in quality, like here in Act 3 where we can watch Paul Serene's speech, and they forgot to edit out the moment where Aidan Gillen forgot his lines. And so tonight is a celebration. Celebration, face of darkness. We celebrate but for some of you this means nothing. Remedy designed game spaces and concept art and sent that over to Lifeboat during production. This meant that any sets which crossed over between the game and the TV show were digitally created, with actors laid over them. Most frustrating for the Remedy team was that they had to reconfigure a lot of their design to fit the TV show after the fact. The CFR chamber, which houses Will's countermeasure, looked completely different in the original build of Quantum Break. After the team saw the live-action footage, they had to go back and remodel that space. In one of her live-action scenes, Courtney Hope, who played Beth, was wearing an earring, so the character artists had to return to the game before shipping and add that same earring to her character model. There are lots of stories like this, but it paints a picture of a Remedy who were doing their damnedest to make live-action mistakes look like purposeful cohesion between the game world and the show. And we've already covered a few places that energy could have gone instead. Episode 3, Deception, is a slow burn for the first 15 minutes. It's the aftermath of the gala, and we get a quick update to Martin Hatch's scheme. This is the episode where he fully embraces his villain role, complemented by his ominous eye drops and a third villain monologue to a dazed and confused Charlie Wilcott, before we move over to Dr. Kim's lab. I've come to free you, my friend. Imprisonment. It's unsettling. Unfortunately, the episode barely fleshes out our understanding of Hatch beyond he wants to take down Paul, and while episode 4 will give his motivation bones, you can barely taste the meat that's missing. In Kim's lab, he has a moment of recognition and understanding with this shifter, cluing us into the fact that he knows a lot more about these monsters than he's letting on. When he blows the lab to hell, framing Sophia Amaral and continuing Paul's descent into madness, you'd think that might release Dr. Kim to the world, potentially ready to stalk Jack in Act 4. But 
If you stuck around this long, you know that this doesn't happen. I guess time monsters are weak to a pack of C4. The rest of the episode returns to Liam, Charlie and Fiona, back again on a whirlwind adventure through a secret tunnel to escape the gala while it's on lockdown. Charlie gets Liam shot, Fiona calls him a piece of shit, Liam, wounded and on the cusp of death, rushes to his wife's hospital and violently murders a monarch soldier there who's been ordered to kill Emily because reasons, I guess. Paul Serene, meanwhile, has a very bad no good day and is told that he needs to initiate lifeboat protocol ASAP. Mr. Serene, if you're going to proceed, now would be the time to decide. The dip in quality is most on show in scenes like this. The stutter effects simply look less impressive than the TV show, and that's mainly because of the sheen of the Northlight engine and Quantum Break's angular art style complement the fractures so much more than they ever could with live action. Remedy went for style, Lifeboat went for realism, and there's a jarring transition here. Monarch branded plastic bags, coffee cups, water bottles, walkie talkies don't look like they were manufactured by a conglomerate, they look like yellow tape has been stuck over amateur theatre props. Christ, I'm pretty sure in this scene Paul Serene is staring at a JPEG of a seagull. The fact the whole thing is brought to us by Nissan doesn't help either. I'm curious to know how much they paid for their sponsorship because it's bloody everywhere, to the point where it's not just distracting, but you could believe it's the only car company in Riverport. In Act 1, when four Nissan cars are chasing each other through a parking garage, the only damage we see is when one of them nicks their headlight, and this is in a scene where a soldier fires a machine gun at Liam Burke's window. Which brings us to the action. Shaky cam isn't inherently bad. The Bourne movies weren't the first films to use it, but in the world of action they definitely popularised it because of the crunch and sense of chaos they added to fight scenes. Sparingly, it can ramp up the tension of the action, but Hollywood, in its infinite wisdom, learned the wrong lessons. What they learned was that shaky cam was cost effective, made badly framed shots look purposeful, and hid poor stunt choreography. <laughs> Quantum Break does not use shaky cam sparingly. Almost every single shot in the show is swaying or shaking. There's one exception to this, any scene featuring Martin Hatch is still and motionless, conveying his stability and strength. This contrast is really effective, but the rest of the show suffers by comparison because the camera won't stop moving! Take this scene from episode 2. Fiona and Charlie are wandering through the woods having a cheeky wee flirt and chatting about work. It's barely four lines of dialogue and the camera is already having minor spasms while it follows them. Or what about a scene we already looked at back in episode 1? This is a quiet, contemplative scene where the focus is on two characters in love. Emily is reassuring Liam with her story about a cat with bare hands, and the camera is tight in, suffocating the actors, struggling to focus on them and swaying from side to side like the whole scene was filmed on a bloody cruise ship. This is both distracting and nauseating when you see it, but the show's greatest sin isn't in the handheld camera or even the shaky cam, they're only a small part of the problem. On their own, a viewer wouldn't go cross-eyed, but if you chuck in some cuts, that's where the budget rears its small, wailing head. Take the hospital fight again. Cut. 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 God, stop it! I had to get to the mainland, but I couldn't do it by car. Needed a new plan. Alright, let's go. I think I'm gonna need a ride. The streets are too hot. So, after raising hell at the gala, Jack is now on the run, desperately trying to make his way back to the swimming hall to reunite with Beth. He rumbles through an abandoned building, tries to cross a bridge, and is rudely interrupted by a fracture set piece where I just watched a ship fast forward through a fucking bridge. God, that never gets old. This breakneck speed forms less than a tenth of Act 4. The rest of our time is spent interacting with computers and reading emails, broken up by a half-hearted puzzle and a two-minute combat sequence. It's the most contemplative part of the story, with some of the strongest character beats and plot elements in the game, but just like elsewhere, player interaction doesn't mesh with how the story wants you to feel. So let's rewind from the bridge back to the derelict building and get a bit more detailed with the world design and environmental storytelling, because there's something very interesting in here. 
Sam Lake would be the first person to admit that the shared Remedy universe wasn't something they were seriously planning in 2016. He's discussed how it was a fever dream, waving a spooky hand at his team from some far off horizon, but there wasn't a strategy in place to combine separate stories into one overarching narrative until control started to take shape. But there is the essence of this idea in Quantum Break, particularly in reference to Alan Wake, which means I get to theorize about Alan Wake again, yeah! If you want to avoid spoilers for Alan Wake, please play it, it's amazing. Jump to the timestamp on screen now. There is a novel's worth of Alan Wake easter eggs in Quantum Break, but the ramifications of these easter eggs rise above surface level nods to Remedy's favourite son. In this rundown building, for example, we find a cute behind the scenes feature for Night Springs, the creepy Twilight Zone show that you could find while exploring Bright Falls. All ponies are made of butter in Night Springs! Ah! This isn't an episode of Night Springs, it doesn't tell us a story, it sneaks a glimpse into the creation of that show, a show which was created in the world of Alan Wake. The narrator has gone mysteriously missing and the director is taking auditions for a replacement. At the time of Quantum Break's release, we all knew that Alan was desperately trying to write his way out of the dark place. Night Springs existing in Quantum Break's world tells us that Jack Joyce and Alan Wake exist in the same reality. And this isn't the only hint we get, we can also find a signed copy of The Sudden Stop, Alan's book, during Act 2. But then, there's the other stuff you can find. Riverport University has a blackboard in one of its lecture halls, where the professor has drawn up diagrams and analyses of the themes of Remedy's game. You can find a trailer for Return, a bizarre TV show which documents two FBI agents, oh, hi Sam Lake, searching for a missing Alan Wake and encountering his alter ego, Mr. Scratch, in the process. Return appears in a bunch of ways across Remedy's universe, always the title of Alan's latest failed escape attempt. If Control is to be believed, there are potentially hundreds of versions of this story out there. So surely this means that Jack Joyce exists in a different reality from Alan, a reality where Alan Wake the Man never existed, but a fictional version of his story was released. But wait, there's more, one more piece of set dressing to find, the video game. Remedies video game, the one I played and loved. We see an office worker playing it on her computer, barely 10 minutes into Alan's nightmare. So does Remedy exist in Jack's universe? Do Jack, Joyce and Paul Serene and Monarch exist in our universe? Is that what we're led to believe? Every Alan Wake easter egg contradicts its own existence in Quantum Break's world. There's one, just one reference to Max Payne in here is a fun joke, but the prevalence of the Alan Wake nods make them feel less like banter and more like potential lore which never add up. It might be unfair to make this comparison, but in hindsight, the release of Control makes Quantum Break's world building look even weaker. The beauty of Control was that every joke, every tease, every moment of levity added to the world building given to us by the FBC in the oldest house. A sticky note which duplicates and overtakes an office. No smoking memos because staff are talking up on a basement level that feels like it's outside, but Quantum Break's humour is more random and less smart. God, that feels arsy to say. Quantum Break has three jokes, and they're all hidden in collectibles. So, he said, here we are. You're gagged and helpless. An erotic audiobook you can listen to, some guy's script for a terrible time travel movie he's writing, and Nick Marster's conspiracy theory. The only joke that doesn't feel forced is the conspiracy theory, because it groans arms and legs, and it relates to our central conflict of the game, monarch solutions and the secrets they hide. Hashtag who is the meat man? Who is he? But what this means is the game has two tones. The wacky goofy tone of the optional collectibles we can find, and the grim oh so serious doomsday tone of the main plot. I just watched a ship fast forward through a fucking bridge. Returning to the swimming hall, Sophia Amaral reluctantly agrees to help Jack and Beth get their time machine working. This is the third and thankfully final time where we're forced to wander around and turn some monitors on. Beth tries to explain to Jack that time cannot be changed. Causal loops are in effect here, they cannot use the time machine to go back and save William, so instead she wants to jump back even further to 2010, steal Will's countermeasure and bring it back to the present. Jack goes cross-eyed and says no, but the decision is stolen from both of them when Sophia Amaral sabotages the time machine and sends Beth all the way forwards instead. 
to the end of time. This is awesome. It adds further complexity to the history Remedy have designed for this world. After hearing about the end of time so much, we're finally going to learn more details about what it actually is, what it looks like, what it feels like to exist in that state. It's Quantum Break's most carefully shrouded mystery, and setting up the reveal with a slow, pregnant build-up while we turn the time machine on suddenly feels like it might be worth it. You're the reason you built the counter. And you've been here ever since. Eleven years. Why? Why didn't you come back? We should get ready. No, we don't get to see the end of time. Ever. Potentially, it was being saved for the sequel that never came, but the end of time and the shifters are the ultimate blue balls that Quantum Break could have played, and that's exactly what the game does. We don't know how long Beth was in the end of time. She barely knows herself. She spent potentially years lost in an apocalyptic wasteland with only a young Paul Serene, the Paul from the start of the game, for company. The two played an intricate game of cat and mouse, battling and hiding from shifters while trying to hunt each other down, until at last, they managed to find the time machine to shoot back to 1999. From there, the rest is history. Paul started up Monarch and, terrified of what he saw and armed with his new foresight, started to develop the lifeboat protocol. Beth, unable to get the time machine working again, endured 11 years of hell waiting for Jack to come and get her. We learn about all of this through two diary entries, not short ones either, and they expertly capture Beth's voice, the self-doubt, and the enduring will. Quote, I watched the birth of a monster. I can't escape the feeling that my actions helped shape what he became. Maybe I could have guided him, maybe if I hadn't tried to hunt him down. That can't be my part in all of this. There has to be more. If I can turn your attention to the Nordic Games Conference one last time, Greg Loudon made a comment on the depth of readable material we can find in Quantum Break. For such a short game, there are layers and layers of emails, research documents, journals and news articles we can find which build a greater understanding of what makes this world run. When asked why, he said, the cheapest and easiest things to change in a game are words. Everything wrong with Quantum Break's identity is wrapped up in this one sentence. The story changed numerous times, we know this. Remedy constructed a ticking clock of a game world with stories and happenings occurring off-screen rhythmically, filling out any blind gaps. Remember, there were four playable characters at one point, providing us with different viewpoints and angles on our time travel story. So, when the attention had to turn to the focus of the TV show and the plot had to be streamed lined to Jack's story, parts had to be cut. And those parts, it seems, were transformed into diary entries. Every line crumpled up and stuffed into Beth's diary can be unwoven and reformed into a whole new game, or even a whole new TV show. Her experience at the end of time isn't shown, it's told to us, forcing the player to use their imagination in a deeply unsatisfying way. Her experience of meeting Will, convincing him she's from the future, helping him create the countermeasure, builds the strong emotional bond between two of our main characters that we never get to see. The moment where she chooses to visit her younger self and pass on a journal full of future events, all in an effort to make a sad scared child believe that she is some chosen one who will one day save the world, is just referenced in a cutscene and through some graffiti. It's hidden from the player. It was sacrificed for a mediocre TV show about Charlie Wilcock getting drunk at a party, and as deeply crafted as the optional collectibles are, they're mainly in the form of emails between Monarch staff. As we've discussed, this was the most cost-effective way to form smooth connections between the TV show and the game. Characters monologuing to each other about whatever just happened in the world of live action, leaving their laptops unlocked and their email passwords on show. A suspension of disbelief is always needed when it comes to this stuff. Nobody writes about the history of a world as transparently as a video game character, but there's one email, one in particular, that I need to highlight from Act 3. Here's an email from Martin Hatch. It's sitting in a random cubicle on the second floor of a Monarch lab. There are employees wandering about with TPS reports and playing the Alan Wake video game, so clearly this floor doesn't need high-level clearance to access. It houses the grunts of the organization. I have aided in Jack Joyce's escape. Why has evil genius Martin Hatch written out a full evil email detailing his evil plan and then sent it to Samantha in accounting? Why? And why has Samantha opened it on her traceable work laptop, read it, and then left the room while it's still on screen? It's just sitting here. <sighs> Let's talk about the good stuff. Whatever happened to you, change it. Don't. We can fix this. Don't. 
We can undo this. Oh, you still don't get it. Huh? It can't be changed. No matter what we do, the pieces fall in all of the exact same places. I've tried. Over and over. Hatch's email is an indicator that Quantum Break's environmental storytelling isn't going to win any awards anytime soon, but there's still some really cool stuff littered throughout the world that's worth noting. When Jack follows Beth through the time machine, he arrives in 2010, just like the originally planned. But Beth is a shadow of her former self, weighed down by the knowledge of the end of time and the proof that it's an inevitable doomsday which can't be stopped. Stepping out of the machine and into a swimming hall six years younger is breathtaking, especially in how it contextualizes our first visit back in Act 2. During that first visit, we're met with red stains splashed on the ground in a corridor, initially looking like blood until we see the paint cans lying nearby. Suspicious wooden targets with bullet holes cracking through them sit off to the side, suggesting that Will was training while he worked on the time machine. But hearing Beth's story about how she lived here for 11 years suddenly paints the swimming hall in a whole new light. We're seeing, represented solely through the junk and the trash, time looping back on itself and the breakdown of Beth Wilder in the process. Gorgeous, bizarre, and sometimes terrifying graffiti is splattered on the walls throughout the game, depicting events which have just happened or are soon to come. These are Quantum Break's version of the manuscripts from Alan Wake, wetting our taste buds when they reference stuff that's waiting for us in the story. It's likely most players will assume these are just cute meta nods from Remedy, more of a storytelling device than something which has true relevance in the world, but it's in Act 4 that we learn these have been Beth the whole time. Watching Jack from a distance, unable to reach him, she's left him hints and clues to the future, while also tapping into our artistic side so she doesn't go mad. Beth has my favourite character arc in this story, even if it is an incredibly tragic one, and the emotional core comes from the environmental storytelling. Together, Beth and Jack set off for Will's workshop, the night sky giving character and flavour through the 4th of July decorations scattered on the rooftops to truly immerse ourselves in this tense heist. Their goal is to steal his countermeasure and use his time machine to jump back to present day. The workshop is so cluttered, overflowing with technology and cables and piping that its true identity is cleverly hidden from us. If you're paying attention, you'll be able to put the links together that we're in the dockyard from Act 2. Will's workshop will later become Ground Zero. But through something as simple as filling an empty, fractured warehouse with junk, Quantum Break is able to conceal the looming threat with subtlety that the rest of the game has been missing. And it's in here that we get one of our handful of puzzles. Which means I can't be nice anymore and we gotta go back to the criticisms. I think a lot of the game's pacing issues could be resolved with a full reworking of its puzzles. There are just two types, holding Y to rewind time or shooting time stop. This means there's little satisfaction to be gained from overcoming these challenges because the answer is always the same. We need to open a door to Will's office, we follow a flashback of him for a few feet and find a switch which only powers up the door for a couple of seconds. The solution is simple, use time stop and run through the door. We need to open a gate to a train yard. We find a switch which only powers up the gate for a couple of seconds. The solution is simple. Use time stop and run through the gate. We need to get up a walkway. The solution is simple. Hold down Y and rewind a lift to carry us up. We need to get over a walkway. The solution is simple. Hold down Y and rewind to before it collapsed. And the most frustrating angle is that rewind puzzles have so much potential. Rewind is a story-based power rather than a gameplay-based one. We can only use it when Jack chooses to. It's unavailable in combat or while generally exploring, which makes it feel contrived. And that's the only word I can use to describe the slightly more complicated puzzles. In Act 3, there's a frozen truck blocking our path to the gala. Jack's jump sucks, but it's definitely good enough that he should be able to clamber over this truck. He could do it on this one, no problem, barely two meters away, but nope. He needs to rewind time, freeze the truck, run up some stairs, and jump on top of it from this gas station. The rules of rewind are never accurately told to the player. Can Jack turn back time by eight seconds? Five seconds? Two seconds? What's his limit? What's stopping him from rewinding the truck just a little more so he can squeeze by it to get to the party? In the effort to form an entertainment experience, it's as if Remedy are desperate that the player never stops moving, never stops jogging along to the next exposition dump, so they don't want to stump the player or make us think for ourselves. I understand the mentality behind this, but it severely limits the gameplay variety that Quantum Break is capable of. And I've saved the best until last. Time Vision. Okay, what is all this? 
Quantum Break's greatest asset is how beautiful it looks, and how artistically its environments have been shaped, so it's absolutely beyond me why Remedy want the player to regularly mask that beauty with Time Vision's ugly filter. You're encouraged to use it during combat to see enemies, it's required in some cases to find the time shard so we can upgrade our powers, and if you're a lore hunter like me, it's the best way to find all of the interactive objects. But look at this. The sheen and shades are cut out of the world, reduced to a globular black and white, strangely blurred screen whenever you need to use it. Aside from the ripples that wave out from under Jack, there's nothing visually appealing about using this power. In fact, it looks like we've just turned the accessibility options on instead. With a wealth of time abilities at our fingertips, Remedy plucked Detective Mode out of Arkham and threw it in here. And by 2016, Detective Mode was already oversaturated. Come with me. We can survive this together. You know it can't be stopped. The conclusion to Beth Wilder's story is incredibly sad. This entire scene is some of the strongest writing in the whole game, and in just a couple of lines, it almost justifies the inclusion of Jack being interviewed by Ogawa. The events of the game come full circle. Jack comes to the same realization as the player, that he, Beth, and Paul were directly responsible for Ground Zero when they clashed in Will's warehouse. With Jack being blasted to the present, he can only watch, helpless, unable to change Beth's fate as Paul shoots her, capped off with the grim imagery of Paul shooting through a vision of Jack's past self to end Beth's life. And this transforms Jack. He's angry and bitter at Paul, the scene solidifying the monster that his old friend has become. Despite just spending a couple of days with Beth, their relationship has grown dynamically and organically, and witnessing the pain she went through just to set him on this path makes him cynical and callous. He sets off to take the countermeasure back from Paul, and we get this beautiful couple of lines to cap off Act 4. You claim Beth Wilder's death had no impact on your behavior, but... Like I said, I barely knew her. So, what you did next? It wasn't personal? No. Good stuff. Flashing into our final junction, we see Paul sealing the countermeasure away in his chamber. His hand has been forced, needing to activate the lifeboat protocol earlier than he hoped. Without his treatments, the Cronon Syndrome has gotten worse, limping through to his office to make our final choice in the game. Keep control or surrender to his paranoia. If the first junction gave us our most impactful choice, the final junction gives us our most important one. Time still cannot be changed, so no matter what, the final moments of the game remain the same. But we get some variations in the hour leading up to those moments. Our choice defines Paul Serene the man, allowing the player to define his attitude, his outlook, his behaviour in the game's last hour. Will he stay rational in the end, or will he embrace his dark side? Let's see what the finale of the TV show has in store for us. I knew you wouldn't listen to me. It was a simple failsafe. Once the chrono- I know what it was. It can't be undone. That was always the point, wasn't it? It wasn't for you to decide when. There's a lot of depth to Paul in the control choice. It's much more interesting to see our villain continue to be empathetic and conflicted, especially with the anger an invested player will have for him after the death of Beth Wilder. Despite not trusting Sophia Amaral, he sends her to the mysterious lifeboat, resigning himself to the fact that his Cronon sickness means he won't be able to join her. Later, when he gives a mournful speech to his friends and colleagues, we see him be somewhat noble, wishing them luck in surviving the end of time and then leaving them to get on with the job. If we're paying attention, we can infer that he does this because he knows that as soon as his sickness transforms him into a shifter, he could endanger them all. If we choose Surrender, Paul embraces his rage and fury. If combined with other choices, he murders Sophia and goes on a rampage. He believes the rest of the company is secretly working to bring him down, resulting in an unhinged rant to those inside the lifeboat and then ordering their death. Episode 4 is the most Paul-centric content we get in live action, and it's all the stronger for it. But unfortunately, the show does dip away from him so we can pick up with Charlie, Fiona and Liam. So. Let's talk about them again, I guess. Jack Joyce. We... He can use the CFR to fix the fracture. We need to get it to him. 
the CFRs, what's powering this place right now, be honest. With time breaking down, Charlie uses his hacking skills to secure a place for him and Fiona on the lifeboat, meaning through the TV show, not the game, we finally get to see what all the fuss is about, what Paul's plan has been from day one. And unfortunately, it's here that all of the previous problems with the live action stuff are solidified, right up until the credits roll. The dialogue is stilted and mumbly, the camera doesn't know what to look at, and the cheapness of the show is particularly etched in the design of the lifeboat itself. Monarch Solutions, this billion dollar company created with the sole purpose of preparing for the end of time, offers up their solution, a couple of bunk beds in a tunnel somewhere. Up until now, the lifeboat has been described as this bastion of hope, bringing about ideas of some great, impressive spaceship ready to protect the last remnants of civilization, and all the TV show can give us is a corridor with plastic sheets hung up. You could argue this is purposeful, maybe it's supposed to be a disappointment, but tell that to the actors standing in awe of some bedsheets. Imagine a world where Quantum Break didn't have a TV show, and instead Jack Joyce's time warp took him on a scenic tour of locations like the lifeboat. Imagine Remedy got to design a full, stylish complex for us to fight through, seeing the preparations Monarch had made for ourselves. Instead, it's a room with paper cups on a desk. Fiona sends Charlie out of the lifeboat. I didn't realise he was allowed to leave, but okay, and he scurries off to the chamber which holds the countermeasure, preparing to help Jack Joyce. Meanwhile, Liam Burke arrives at Monarch, planning to break into the lifeboat before time runs out. What happens next is solely dependent on the choice the player made and the impressive amount of variations that Lifeboat Productions filmed gets to be shown off here. You're one of Monarch's elite. The one they tell me is a traitor. I'm not a traitor. I know what you want. You're protecting what's yours. I want to protect what's mine. In the control choice, Liam and Emily run into Paul, desperately trying to find ways to keep Jack from stealing the countermeasure. Liam has evolved over the past three episodes to see through Monarch's lies, to let himself be more doubtful about the power structure he's a part of. He's as anti-Monarch as you could get by this point, especially because the company nearly killed his wife. So, when Paul Serene arrives and asks him for help, asks him to risk his life and fight Jack, the natural response for this hardened mercenary, who's witnessed firsthand how untrustworthy Paul can be, is to send a pregnant Emily off with a bad guy and suit up for a boss fight. I understand that Paul promises a place for Emily on the lifeboat, but the Liam Burke of the past two days wouldn't trust this guy with anything, especially not the woman he loves, and it's all a result of choosing to keep Paul rational, lean into the characterization the video game has been building to. Basically, the player is forced to trade Liam Burke's character arc for Paul Serene's, and that's not fair or satisfying. You're gonna have to fucking kill me! Cause right now, Liam, I'm thinking about more than myself. You don't know what Joyce is gonna do. No, I don't. But I have faith in Fiona, and she believes in Joyce, so I gotta believe too. The final moments of the control variation of the episode have Liam and Charlie confronting each other once and for all in the countermeasure chamber. Charlie plainly yells about his character arc before Martin Hatch shoots him in the head, and he and Liam get into a fist fight. I think. I honestly couldn't tell you because of the cuts and the shaking. Their battle ends with Liam stabbing Martin Hatch in his left eye, suiting up in striker gear, and preparing for his boss fight with Jack in the next act. The music dramatic, emphasising minor notes and swelling to show how tragic his evolution has become. Remember this, it's important later. In the surrender choice, Liam and Emily join Charlie, and the three of them head off to the chamber together, united in their plan to unlock the countermeasure and help Jack save the day. When Martin Hatch arrives, he kills Liam and Emily, but not before he's shot in his right eye. So before we wrap up on the TV show and jump into the final act of the game, let's talk Martin Hatch. There's going to be a really minor spoiler for Control in here, so just like when we were theorising about Alan Wake, here's the timestamp for where to jump to if you want to avoid that. You ready? Let's go. Martin Hatch is a shifter, something we're clued into through a collectible in the next act, and we see firsthand during Jack's siege on Monarch. This makes it truly bizarre that during his battle with Liam Burke, he doesn't transform like we know he can, but hey, maybe the budget had ran out by that point. Something that is really, really cool when comparing the two versions of this episode, though, are the ways in which Martin dies. Whether it's through Liam or Emily, both timelines involve his eyes being gouged out by a Burke. Liam gets the one on the right, Emily gets the one on the left. 
Throughout the episodes, we regularly get to see Martin use eye drops. In some scenes, the whites of his eyes are slightly discoloured and bloodshot. Because shifters exist at all points in time, it's fair to believe that the reason Martin needs to use these eye drops is because he constantly feels the physical pain of the two timelines where he dies. How cool is that? For all my bitching in this video, and I'm aware that some of my criticism is just bitching, that has to be one of the most subtle, clever little through lines Remedy has ever brought to its games. It's never directly referenced, never directly explained, it's barely a character detail to give Hatch a gimmick, but the focus his death gets in this final episode really caps it off as an incredibly clever piece of writing. And then we turn our attention to Control. There is one, just one, connection between Quantum Break and Control and it comes in the form of Dylan Faden. I was in a dark place, and there was a dark man there. His name was Mr. Door, and he told me that there are many worlds, side by side, on top of each other, some inside of others. Mr. Door, a being that crossed realities, crossed timelines, and spoke to Dylan through his dreams. And what better synonym for a door than a hatch? That's all there is, and there's not enough information given to us to infer this really is a connection. But there are weird parallels between Quantum Break and Control. Chronon harnesses are very similar in concept to the HRAs that Casper Darling designed to protect the FBC from the Hiss. The countermeasure looks like a tiny version of Hedron. It even has the same number of sides, I'm pretty sure. Quantum Break is more interested in timelines rather than realities. Its core philosophy behind time travel and causal loops doesn't dip into alternate universes, rendering them kind of irrelevant here, but maybe Martin Hatch isn't just a shifter. Maybe he's something more. Maybe he's an entity, the kinds we learn about in Control. This is hardly that important, after all, Remedy doesn't even own the rights to Quantum Break anymore. If they wanted to incorporate it officially into Control's universe, they would need to buy it back from Microsoft, meaning Martin Hatch is probably never going to be seen again. But just in case he is, I wanted to note it here. Anyway, enough theorising, stop having fun. Back to Quantum Break. The end of time was closing in. And you still believed you could fix it? The solution was inside Monarch Tower, the countermeasure. Our grand finale picks up minutes after the TV episode. Jack has made it to Monarch headquarters. The fractures are ramping up their frequency, but he's got a bone to pick and a timeline to save. Time to battle up to the top of the building. Depending on which junction choice we made, we're either helped by Fiona or Charlie, who unlock security gates for us as we clamber up each level. What this means is a lot of standing around. Fiona? Is that you? Yes. I wasn't sure if I could make this work. Listen, the CFR, it's not easy to reach, but you can access it from three Ah, uh, just let me through! The idea behind this is solid. It continues to ease the transition between the TV show and the events of the game, but it's yet another example of how the involvement of the show minimises the impact of the gameplay. There's no other reason for us to be standing at these fucking gates than to have the idiots from the TV show parrot lines at us in an effort to seem relevant. Irrespective of the chaos of the fractures, the Monarch building is clean and white, occasionally broken up by that yellow glaze that coats so much of the scientific locations we previously explored. Explored. This makes the carnage we find left in the wake of Martin Hatch's shifter rampage more shocking and terrifying when we see what it can do. It's reminiscent of Final Fantasy VII, that haunting moment when out of nowhere we wander through Shinra hallways, seeing dead bodies littered in corners, building up a sense of suspense for Sephiroth's power and ruthlessness. Just like back in 1997, this moment is extremely effective in highlighting the terrifying potential of this universe's big bad. In fact, much of our exploration through Monarch is concentrated around building Martin Hatch up to astronomical heights. We see him from a distance tearing soldiers limb from limb. We find correspondence detailing how frightened Monarch workers are of him. He crosses Jack Joyce in a cutscene as a formless shadow looming over us, considering cutting us down but leaving us alive because he thinks we're useful. In any other game, you'd expect all of this build-up, this dedication of an entire section to pay off with a confrontation of some kind. But if you're this far in the video, you'll know that that's not the case with Quantum Break. Martin Hatch vanishes from the story, being reserved for the post-credit scene, and I've got to ask, 
Why? We'll get to Quantum Break's final bosses in a moment, but there's categorically no reason why Martin Hatch shouldn't be in there. I understand that Lifeboat Productions killed a version of him in the TV show already, and Remedy wanted to keep him around for sequel bait, but even a set piece where we needed to survive exposure to him rather than take him down altogether could have made him one of Remedy's most fascinating and memorable villains. Instead, the game plays it far too safe, waiting for a sequel that never came. This is one of you. Really? Look, you have to realize you're not going to keep me from the CFR. Reaching the countermeasure, Jack and Liam finally go toe-to-toe -to -toe for their epic battle, Pasty Time Hero versus his Dark Reflection Action Man. Following Liam's fall, rise and fall again, with the epic music of Episode 4's finale ringing in our ears, this feels like the culmination of TV show and game finally clashing, finally meaning something. Oh, he's dead. Burke isn't the worst boss in Quantum Break, we'll get there shortly, but I can only really say that because he's barely a boss at all. He's just a striker enemy that uses a dampener so our powers don't work. We shoot him while he flits around the room, putting him down like the wounded dog he's become. Any emotional residence the game wants to bring out of us is cast aside because he's so easy and after four episodes of build-up, it just feels disappointing. Grabbing the countermeasure, Jack has the sudden, awkward realisation that after all of this, he doesn't know what the hell to do with it, so we fight through to Monarch's time machine. He taps a quick date in and charges back a couple of days to Riverport University. The plan is to get to Will before his death and have our dear old brother explain to us what we need to do to save the world. And this is awesome. The earliest I could go back to was the time that the Corps was first activated. At the university. Not much time to rescue your brother. I didn't have a choice. Just like when we flashed back to the early days of the swimming hall, returning to the start of the game completes the time travel circle Remedy has set up. Everything, no matter what, leads back to Will, Paul and Jack in the crumbling library. The catalyst of Jack's adventure is given even more power because it becomes the defining moment of the endgame. As we tear through the campus, having unlocked all of our time powers now, the structure of the game reinforces how much stronger we are than our opening hour. Even if the moment-to-moment -moment combat doesn't live up to its own potential, bringing everything back to the start simulates a power fantasy for us. The radio calls we overheard in Act 1 of soldiers claiming Jack was in different parts of the campus now make sense, because they weren't just hunting one Jack, they were hunting two. Honestly, Act 5's journey back through time is when Quantum Break feels like it's starting to enjoy itself. It's just a bloody shame that it arrives with less than 45 minutes to go. Jack reaches Will seconds after the library collapsed. It turns out, as Will happily explains, he never died. Future Jack, the Jack we're playing as now, always saved him. We just didn't get to see that because we were knocked out and stuffed in a truck. This is a nice, clean explanation, all in keeping with what we've learned so far. Time cannot be changed. No, future. No, 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 no. It's the only way. We need to stop the fracture here, in this time. Now. And Jack, despite everything he's seen, everything he's learned, everything he's experienced, still believes that time can be changed. He's got Beth on the brain, desperately trying to search for a way to save her life, and I want to reach the TV and give him a slap. Because this is the 50th time you've had this conversation, Jack! Get it into your thick skull! A fracture interrupts Jack and Will as they trek onto the time machine, and Remedy twists the knife when Jack spots Beth from across the car park, frozen in time. He sees her, considers trying to unlock her from the fracture, bringing her with them back to the present, but the words of Will still ring in his ears. It seems at last, for a second, he understands. He can't save her. He can't change the past. And then, in the space of a loading screen, the game falls apart. Paul Serene's boss fight is the worst that Remedy has ever devised. We've covered their shortcomings with bosses in the past, but Quantum Break's last section feels like it dipped into my brain, pulled out a checklist of everything that makes a crappy boss, and decided to implement that just to mess with me. A bunch of desperate people sitting around in a bunker somewhere waiting for the inevitable? Jesus, Paul. You stole the CFR, Jack. I stole it? And the plan depends on it. So... I'll take that back now, please. So, let's go down the list. Item 1. A boss that can only be hurt at certain scripted moments. Paul hunkers down in a time shield, surrounded by strikers who overwhelm the player. He's invulnerable in this state. We couldn't hurt him if he wanted to, only able to get a crack in when he stands up and lets us. 
Item 2. A boss with an attack that can kill us in one hit. One hit kills by themselves aren't an immediate problem, but when that's your big bad's only move, it makes him both uninteresting and frustrating to fight. Paul summons this bizarre area of effect attack which spreads across the entire arena, forcing the player to just run away. It always starts at one side of the room, so we just need to mumble over to the other side. But the whole fight is such a cacophony of noise that sometimes you'll miss where he's starting the attack, meaning a death feels cheap, the result of sensory overload rather than a powerful villain. Item 3. Setting your checkpoint to before the cutscene. If Paul does kill us, then the game doesn't reset us to the start of the fight. We need to sit through a loading screen, listen to Jack say, It's bigger than the two of us. For the 20th time, then skip that cutscene and sit through a second loading screen before we can leap back into action. And finally, item 4. And this is the big one. A boss fight where you're not actually fighting the boss, you're fighting his minions. Paul summons a handful of strikers during each phase. We need to kill them first so he'll open himself up. It means that this final fight, friend versus friend, is actually friend versus friend's henchmen. An hour ago, we saw Paul kill Beth. We liked Beth. Her downward spiral tugged at our heartstrings. We want to sink our teeth into Paul Serene, time-traveling hyper-capitalist, not Paul Serene's stupid mates. And so, with a caved-in head and no last words, Paul Serene dies, splayed on the tiles of the swimming hall. Jack barely sniffs at the death of his old friend, no pain in his next words as he and Will carry on to the time machine, slotting their MacGuffin into place and, in their own words, saving the universe. Jack pours all of his power into the countermeasure and supercharges it, blasting a stabilizing field throughout time and fixing the fractures. He and Will have stopped the end of time from happening, right? Which raises the question, in the end, did Jack Joyce in fact change things? He averted an apocalypse that both Beth and Paul saw with their own eyes. That shouldn't be possible. If nothing can be changed, how did Jack prevent a preordained doomsday? Well, simple. He didn't. There are plenty of clues we can find to tell us this. The end of time that Beth witnessed that Paul and Monarch were preparing for didn't happen in 2016. It will happen in 2021. Beth notes this date down in her journal, Paul has it up in his office, but through the manipulations of Martin Hatch and the increased frequency of the fractures, he starts to doubt himself, believing that the end of time was happening much sooner than he believed. Jack didn't change anything. In five years, the end of time will hit, just as it always had. Was he right? Or is it possible to change things? No, Clarice, we've been over this. In the game's closing seconds, Jack's interview comes to a close, and the game gives us a nice, long tease for what would come. Martin Hatch is now the formal head of Monarch. He's so impressed by Jack's power that he offers him a job, and Jack realizes he's inherited Paul's junction ability, seeing two realities, branching off into the future sequels, that were lost to time. In the run-up to the game's release, Sam Lake pitched Quantum Break to audiences as the first season of one large story, spanning years and timelines and characters. But even before we got to play as Jack, one thing was clear. Remedy's ambitious project wasn't going to combine TV and games after Quantum Break 1. Perhaps there would be spin-off shows, but whatever form a sequel would take, it wouldn't look like transmedia. There's a brilliant quote from Ben Salter of Phoenix Bazaar that sums up the biggest problem with Microsoft and Remedy's experiment, so rather than try to bastardize it, I'll just read it for you here verbatim. Consisting of around 100 minutes of content, the TV show wasn't a TV show. It wasn't even a miniseries. Quantum Break will be remembered as a game that included four 20-minute choose-your-own-adventure live-action cutscenes. I would argue that the only successful thing that came from this hybrid was how necessary the TV show was to the story that Remedy crafted. Yes, it retread territory that was better explored in the game. Yes, we followed three characters who had very little bearing on Jack's adventure, but the TV show filled in gaps that the game refused to, forming one big entertainment experience. But refused to is the operative phrase there. Everything we got from the TV show would have, in fact, benefited from being part of the game instead. And it could have been. 
The lifeboat should have been a level for us to explore. We should have been allowed to experience a shifter through a boss fight, rather than watching some smoke in a box on live action. The Junction episodes could have been extended with more choices and more influences to give us a deeper understanding of the Paul we shape. You can see how much potential is ingrained in Quantum Break's ideas. Time is presented as such a colossal force of nature, complemented by Remedy's stellar visual and audio design philosophy, that it will be a shame not to see these concepts return in the future. When Act 5 opens with a subway train crashing and shifting through a skyscraper, you get just a fraction of this universe's possibilities. But when those moments are fleeting, replaced with a focus on shaky cam fistfights or conversations about dream cats, it's hard not to feel distracted and deflated with the controller in your hand. How would you describe Quantum Break in one word? Exciting. Out of all the games you've made, which one are you most proud of? Alan Wake. Is this live action stuff going to be dumb? Nope. I said at the start of this video that Quantum Break does not deserve to be forgotten to time. It deserves to be remembered, so titles like it aren't wasted in the future. Thanks for watching. There's a chance that some of you were a little confused when this video popped up in your subscription feed, seeing as a lot of you came here from Nubis Humanus Elden Ring. If that's the case and you stuck around to the end, thank you. These are normally the videos that I make. Uh, the Nubis Humanus stuff comes out every couple of months. Um, and w would you consider dropping a like so these longer videos can get a wee boost? Um, I, I had to ask. Special shout out to my patrons currently scrolling up the left hand side. Order thanks go to Jin Rummy, Ross Hupp, Unholy Biscuit, Greg Greed, Spade Games, Uzair, Leon, Matthew Sinclair Thompson, Justin Johnson, X Wrights, Thaxman, Shemax, Tibby Galanu, Aiden, Jonathan, Taylor Borrell, Zachary Johnston, Dexter TK421, DNSCH, Martin Gribben, Jordan S, Jared Trainum, Nick, Damp Gibbon, Monicari, Kieran Gresty, Jade Kavanaugh, Phil P, Liam DeBorn, Lamar825, Jeremy Shore, Patrick Salai, Ike N, The All Brand Man, Jake, Tempe, Courtney Wampler, Anthony Holder, David J. Morin, Minute Zero, Iskerton, Callum Armitage, Christopher Tierney, Torstein Sunness, Fipsy, Derek DeRozia, Luca, Tomins, Heliquin, Sammy Stuff, Jaguke, Jordan, Alberto Calles, Austin Hagerman, Lee, Austin Long, Ty Braz, Matthew Bendel, Dini, Zachary Powers, Andrew Muinos, Compulsory Fungus, Dank Hank, Prospero finished my dissertation, Now in Guitarra's Knopoff, Lizzie Gale, Alan Black, Callsign Noor, David Bedard, Derek Eight, The Riffmaker, CC, Jared Helfer, Gray McLaughlin, Samlin, Oliver Farrell, John Foster Ag, Robert Capel, Matt McCulloch, Guillaume Barreros Ferreira, Ethan, Paul W, Damp Gibbon, Chief Sweep, Ihor May, Jonathan Lum, Thomas Banchak, Eddie Wingfors, Reese, Nicholas Here, Cakesters, Strupp, Angry Optimist, Yana Grasfrau, Lore Opossum, Long Cheddar, Jordan Halsey, Amory Selden, Ryan Smith, Toxter, Donis Conva, Ashley Broning, 100 Sams, Neil Dudgeon, Michael Diaz, Nathaniel Waters, Dinkin Pearson, Kyle Piers, Seb Scott, Lonely Ronan, Crisp Bread, Kane Highwind, Neve Care, and Johnny Miller. Thank you all so much, I really appreciate it, and take care.